shopping being done, too much food, too many parties, too many gifts. It's just never, not enough rest, not enough money, not enough time. But this is that, that state that we get caught in every year. And I, I think every year I tell myself, I'm not doing it this year. I'm not doing it. I'm going to praise Jesus. I'm going to remember what the season's about. And then every year it's like, I just need to get to January 2nd. Like, just get me past New Year's, too. Just get me to the second. If we can get me to February, no, you know what? March. Because February has Valentine's Day. Get me to March, and we'll be okay. It, because it just never stops. But I'm here today because Jesus reminded me, and I want to remind you, that Jesus is the gift. In the simplest terms that you can put it, Jesus is the gift. And the thing I'll say that stuck... Uh, I, re- I jotted it down as I was studying because Pastor Max sent me his notes. And if you know how Pastor and I preach, we preach different. We, we just go about things. We, we both deliver the message. We just do it a different way. So when I got his notes, I was like, this is really good. You know, I'm going to try this. And I, and I tried, and I tried, and I tried. And, and no matter how hard I tried, I couldn't get the feeling that I got reading it to come out as I spoke it. So... It it just made me think that Christmas was never meant to be a burden. And that stuck with me all week long. Christmas was not meant to be a burden. It wasn't meant to stress us out. It It was meant for the opposite of that. Jesus was a gift. Jesus brought us the gift of salvation. Jesus was joy. You hear those words all the time, joy and hope. Matter of fact, you look at mantles over fireplaces and they have those stocking holders, depending on how many kids you have or, you know, what, what, how many stockings you got to hang. It's joy or hope. You know, I know in some Mexican families, for us, it's Merry Christmas and all the stockings are all lined out. <laughs> but the thing is, is Tony and I were actually talking about this and she was telling me a story about some of the people she worked with. She said, they were busy getting ready, and they were putting together the nativity scene, right? And, and there were lights, and they wanted, you know, they wanted lights, and they wanted the music to go, and they, they were going to decorate it, and everything was going to be great. And so the time came, and what had they forgot? Baby Jesus. Baby Jesus. That's where it starts. That's where it ends. And it's just like us during Christmas. It's like what we tend to forget. Because I tell you what, there's nothing like... I love my family with all my heart. I love my wife with all my heart. I woke up uh, Thursday, and I was like, today's a beautiful day. I've, I've got my message written. I've practiced. I'm going to rest. And, and so I'm laying in bed, and then you hear, the vacuum cleaner. And I already know what kind of day it's going to be. It's going to be that day. I open the door, and it smells like 409 lemon scent, and I'm like, oh, gosh. There goes, there goes that, you know? But, but I love it because these are the things we do in preparation to show, share our joy and love with others, right? But again, it wasn't meant to be a burden. But I have to remind myself that even though a lot of us are like that right now, there's a lot of us who aren't. Christmas is a different experience for everyone. Some people are mourning. You know, the holidays are one of those seasons where we like to mourn because some of our favorite memories are attached to special people who aren't there anymore. Or maybe we are mourning that our children are growing up and Christmas has changed from Christmas morning to, hey, we'll see you later. We're going to go over here and we're going to go over there. And the next thing you know, you're sitting in the living room watching a Hallmark movie you saw four times with your wife already again. That's what Christmas turns into. And we shouldn't mourn that. That's growth. That's part of our life. It's, we're put here to serve. We're put here to love those in front of us while they're here for us. And then we're, we're supposed to serve God and allow his plan to move forward and accept it. But it was never meant to be a burden. And I want to bring this message to you today because I think that if we can reintroduce joy and hope into the world into Christmas... This is a great opportunity to do that. I've got it written down here, so when y'all see me looking down, I wanted to make sure I didn't make any mistakes. There was a study done by Dr. Kurt Richer in 1950 at Harvard, and it's about mice 
It was a forced swim test. So they had these cylinders, right? And it sounds terrible, and it was a terrible experiment, but I'll tell you what it was. They dropped mice into this cylinder filled with water where they couldn't reach the bottom. And then they forced them to swim until they drowned. They put the first batch of mice in there, and they swam for 15 minutes before eventually succumbing and, and going underwater. The next group of mice was put in, and at the 14-minute mark, they were removed, dried off, fed, allowed to rest, and then put back in the water. Do you know how long they swam after that? 60 hours. 60 hours. Hope was introduced to the mice. Now, that wasn't God in that experiment. We know God is coming from us. He sent his son for, to give us salvation, to give us hope, right? But if you think about the difference that understanding that, that, that love that Jesus has for us, that hope he brings, I'm going to tell you right now, some of us out here have endured some hard, hard things in our lives. I tell you what, if you ever wrote down, if you ever put pen to paper and wrote down some of the things, you'd look at it and think that that was a, a tragedy that was written for Hollywood. But we make it. We make it every time. Now, we don't always make it through joyful, but we always make it through. Let's turn to the gospel and see what, what Jesus has to say about this. We'll go to the first slide. In Luke 2, 8, and there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. Imagine that. You're out looking over your sheep. It's just another night. There's nothing extraordinary about your life. You're doing something you don't want to do. I don't care what anybody says. Nobody wants to be out with sheep in the middle of the night watching over them, right? And then all of a sudden, this bright light and an angel of the Lord comes to you. And your first reaction is, I'm terrified. Why do you think that is? What are some good reasons to be terrified? It was overwhelming, this massive light? Was it the glory of the angels, the angel that came? For me, my first thing is, no matter what that angel says, nothing is going to be the same after he says it. That's what's terrifying. We've had those moments in our lives, I know all of us had, where you just know that after this happens, nothing's going to be the same, good or bad. You, ever, you get married, you know that the day after you get married, nothing's going to be the same. You have a child. You know that first night you get the baby and you're on your own, that nothing's going to be the same, good or bad. That's terrifying. Some of us have been through multiple, multiple circumstances in our life where we're like, you know what? I can look back and say, at this moment, my life changed forever. And I knew it was going to. I look back and I think, I'd like to say there's a lot of joyful moments that, that, that made me feel that way. But most of them were tragic. I didn't find God until my dad passed. That, that's crazy. I knew him. I didn't know he was looking for me. I didn't know I needed him until after. That was just one of those moments where life changed and, and there was nothing I could do about it but go with it. Well, luckily, you know, it, it wasn't too long. They didn't keep, the angels didn't keep them in suspense because I, cliffhangers I'm not good with. Does anybody watch television on demand? Y'all watch shows on demand? I've decided that I no longer watch series that don't already have an ending. I invested too much of my life watching series that, you know, I'm like, when does the next season come out? And I'll type it in there. And it was like, last season was 2017. I just watched 32 shows and it has no ending. I don't do that anymore. Now I just usually watch The Office because it's got an ending and I've seen it a million times and I know how it's gonna go. But here's the good stuff. We'll go to the next slide. The angels didn't keep them waiting. In Luke 2.10, it says, 
But the angel said to them, to the shepherds, do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. We're going to go to the next one because I want to keep these together. Suddenly, the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heaven and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. That's where I would have been terrified. I can't, I can't imagine seeing one angel coming to talk to me, but to see the heavens open up and see the armies of God in unison talking to shepherds in a field in the middle of the night. When the angels had left and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see these things that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. So it says right here, they hurried off to see the good news. They didn't make sure everything was in order. They didn't ask if they should. They didn't say, hey, maybe we'll go next week and, and see what it's about. They hurried off immediately. See, after, after this, the shepherds returned home, and they never spoke of it again. That's not true. The shepherds went home, and they told everybody, anybody that would listen, right? Because we'll go to the next slide. We're going to keep rolling with Luke, and I know I'm coming at you fast, but this Luke, he had me going. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told to them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. Now, when Jesus came, when Jesus was delivered to us as the gift, it was a gift of salvation. The shepherds, um, I, read, I read in the Bible that the shepherds were actually doing priest duties for the temple. So they were to look over the, the sheep to keep them safe. That was their job. And they were in a tower because it says they were looking over the sheep. These sheep, you know, were the ones that were marked to be sacrificed for Passover. So they had to be clean and pristine. And we were talking uh, yesterday, and I often say we were talking, I'm, I'm talking about my wife 99% of the time, that it's just so funny that, that Jesus is the Lamb of God. And the shepherds came to the Lamb of God to see him. And ultimately, Jesus would be sacrificed for us. You know, it was a turning point because this is where the Old Testament kind of met the New Testament in saying that the time for sacrifice was over that Jesus had come to set us free, that Jesus was the key, that Jesus was our salvation. And I think that when we think about Christmas uh, and, and all that it, that it brings and it means and how we lose the translation of what it means to the church and how we as the church are responsible for introducing Jesus into Christmas again. Doesn't that sound strange that you have to remind people that Christmas is about Jesus? His name is in it but we still have to remind people. We had such a good time at the parade this past year, and I think there were close to 50 floats. I think 50 plus floats. Do you know how, how many of them had a reference to Jesus in them? Two. Us, we were one of them. We were one of them. Two of them. And I don't think it's done maliciously. I don't think that Sometimes you just forget the baby Jesus. The manger scene is there. You just forget baby Jesus. I think that all of us know that we love Jesus. I think we celebrate Christmas with good intentions. We put up lights because we want joy in our hearts. I have never been, I've never been shopping so much in the last two weeks, and I've run into people who are both joyful and annoyed at the same time. That's me. I can be in the parking lot. What are you doing? Either back out or I'll yell, slow down. I don't know when I turned into that guy, but I'm in the parking lot now and I'm yelling at people, slow down. But you get me in the store and I'm like, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. You know, I hear a crying baby. I'm like, oh, they're tired. You know, same breath. I could be at dinner later on that night and be like, can somebody please quiet that kid up? 
That's me. And I've noticed that people out in the world right now, that's kind of what we're like. We want to be joyful, but the world, but the world. And we're going to get to that because we have to be willing to testify. We have to be willing to testify. I don't know when we had to become so aware of where we testified or who we testified to, but that was never the intent. That's another burden that we need to have removed from us. Let's go to the next slide. I pray that you share your faith with others. It will grip their lives too, as they see the wealth of good things in you that come from Jesus Christ. Good things that come from Jesus Christ. It's so easy to focus on everything that's wrong. I know, I, I don't know if I'm, respond, I'm the only one that does this, and I'll, I'll speak to, to the fellas out there. By the way, today is the busiest shopping day for men in the United States, Christmas Eve. I am so guilty. I am so guilty that, that we would buy my, my children presents, right, and family presents, and then we'd have the thing where we'd say, okay, what did we get for who? And we're writing it down, and it's got to be, okay, we got Ollie three, we got Layla three. That box is bigger. That's kind of like two. Well, what if we put that box in with another box? That way it looks like she's got two, but one of them is big. Which all works out. It's just Christmas math. This is dad Christmas math. Because what it usually ended up with me would be at 11 o'clock, I'm looking for a Walmart, I'm at Supercenter, I'm looking for something open, and I end up going, buying way more stuff than I need when it was just fine what I had. We want to reflect back on our lives. We want to look at where we're at right now and say we need more. We need more. This is the season that that happens. And I, 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 I've created a video for the men ministry, and I'll share it with you now, is that you're doing a great job, all of you. You are enough. You don't have to do any more. Don't let the world tell you how we're supposed to celebrate Christmas. Don't let the world tell you what a good Christmas is. Don't try to compete with someone about who's getting the best gift, who's getting the most gift, who makes the best food, my mother-in-law. We're not doing that. We're not doing that. You're enough. What we do is enough. Praise Jesus. Celebrate him. Accept his gifts to you. It's enough. We can't keep looking at ourselves and saying we should be more. If you want to look at yourself and say I should be more of something, pray more. Let go more. Stress less. That doesn't fit in, but I always say if you can stress less, you're already winning. You're already winning because stress is something that, oh, boy, it comes in high doses in December. Mine starts in November. I feel it coming. And that's a terrible feeling because you know you're going to mess up and you feel it coming. I'm going to probably, it, it's only been over the last five or six years where I would put our family in such a position that we were still trying to figure out Christmas in April and May. You know what I mean? You make decisions in, in December that you're trying to catch up with in April and May. And we're not doing that anymore. Because we are going to redirect our, our focus to Christ. And that's how we're going to move forward. And I, I know I tell myself every year, and now I'm telling y'all, and, and Pastor Max wanted me to include that, that, that if we keep Jesus at the forefront, everything else will be beautiful. Let's go to the next slide. So do not be ashamed to testify about the Lord or ashamed of me, his prisoner. But join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. Suffering, that's a word that strikes a, a silent chord. There are many people that are suffering right now in the world. Uh, there's people we know. There's people that you walk by in the streets. There's people in your own family. There's people that are sitting right next to you that are suffering. They're in mourning. It's a tough season, but you'll never hear them say it. 
Nobody wants to ruin your Christmas by telling you that they're having a tough one. I don't think I've ever talked to somebody who, who is like, oh, Christmas is horrible. I'm, I, it's this, it's that. You know, you don't want to be the bad news bear. You don't want to ruin every, the bad news bear. <laughs> you don't want to be that person. And again, I'll offer this to you. It was never meant to be a burden. It's a gift. Jesus was a gift. So in simple terms, I'm saying, do we go into the holidays as adult expecting things? Do we expect gifts? If somebody comes to my house without a gift for me, do I turn them away at the door? No. But will I walk through someone's door without a gift? That's the same, that's the same thing. Pastor Max wanted me to point out that in December, we go to more parties. We, we, we eat with more people. We talk to people we don't usually talk to for the most of the year. And we, have, we send out cards with pictures of our family on it just so they'll know who we are. Right? That this is, this is another reflection of, look, it should not have to be that. Whether you come bearing the gift whether you come expecting a gift, it's the same burden. I don't ever want to not go somewhere because I didn't, I didn't get something or I don't have something to give. Sometimes I just, want, I just want to be around the people that I love. And that's real easy to say, but it's hard to do. I know we've talked about that before. It's real easy to say, you know, presents don't matter. Well, if they don't matter, then why do we stress so much about them? Why do we put so much energy, effort, time, frustration. My wife and I have actually argued over giving a gift. Argued of what's right and what's wrong. And she says, you always make me sound like the bad guy. Well, when you're up here preaching, you can make me sound like the bad guy. But I'm going to go, go on and say that the world is teaching us, maybe not us in this room, but the world is teaching our, our, our children, our grandchildren, the younger people, what Christmas means. And that's because there's an absence of us influencing that growth, that understanding. And it is a responsibility, but it's not a burden. Sharing Jesus Christ is not a burden. And, and you're up against the world. Know that. You are up against the world. But I'm going to go my favorite verse, John 16. 33, I have told you all this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. I know Pastor and I have talked about you're not going to surprise Jesus. You're not going to surprise God. There's no secret that you're going to tell, uh, tell him that he doesn't already know. The thing is, is that we must take the joy of Jesus with us everywhere we go. Not just when we're walking into church or walking into a party. We've got to take him with us everywhere. When we stop and think, and, one, and Noel it's referred to Jesus as the light of the world, correct? Right now, I know many of us would consider the world a dark place. I don't go into dark places without a light. Carry Jesus with you everywhere you go. That way you'll be able to see those that were meant to be in your life and those that weren't. Those who have good intentions for you and those who don't. Those who are trying to serve God but haven't found him yet versus those who are trying to keep you from serving God. And I know this is a joke that goes on every year and, and, and I try to smile whenever I hear it. I say Merry Christmas, and sometimes I get a Merry Christmas back, and sometimes I get a Happy Holidays back, which is fine. It's fine, but don't expect me to say Happy Holidays to make you feel more comfortable. I don't expect you to say Merry Christmas to make me feel more comfortable, and I, I want to say that when we talk about Jesus, when we talk about the joy that, that Christmas brings, let's be unapologetic. 
I'm not going to apologize because God sent Jesus Christ to, to, for salvation and joy and hope, and this is what we're celebrating. I'm not going to be apologetic for that. So when we go out into the world and we meet these people who want to say happy holidays or want to take Jesus out or they want to say this is not what Christmas was really about, okay. I know in the last time I preached I said we're not supposed to argue. You know, Jesus always says turn the other cheek. That's a lesson I'm still learning. My wife will tell you that I fail at it often. I have such a hard time turning the other cheek, especially if I got something really witty to say back. You know, Ricky's shaking his head. <laughs> Mary's shaking her head with Ricky. <laughs> you know, I, it's just something that um, sometimes in the middle of our struggles, we can't see the joy in our journey, but, but we've got to rejoice regardless. Let's go to the next slide. This one's also hard. Though the fig tree does not bud and there are no grapes on the vines, Though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, there, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. That sounds like a bad time. If you just stop, it's hard to believe that the next sentence says, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful and God my Savior. How many of us feel like sometimes there is just nothing to be thankful for in life? Because we're looking for everything that's wrong. And I know last week, when I, or the, the week before when I preached, I said, we're going to find exactly what we're looking for. You go looking for Jesus and you'll find him. You go looking for a reason to be joyful, you'll find him. You go looking for someone that you kind of don't like already to like less, and you'll find it. There's some things that we tolerate from people in our lives that we love, that it's, that behavior is seen in someone outside of our homes. It's just like, mm, you know, I just want to shake them and tell them snap out of it. We have to go out and seek joy in this season. And I know I'm, I'm joy, joy, joy. I'm going to keep bringing it up. Jesus Christ is joy. Jesus Christ is the gift. Jesus Christ is the reason. And being joyful, even when it's not a good season, is difficult to do. I implore you to keep looking. Turn your eyes to Jesus and keep focusing on him. The love that Jesus has for us, the love of Jesus, is far above human circumstance. There's nothing that happens to us here that makes Jesus love us less. Maybe this year wasn't the greatest. Maybe I, I often do this. I said, maybe this year wasn't the greatest. Maybe I could have done more. Maybe I could have given more. Maybe I could have failed less. I stress over uh, the ministries. I had, we had the teen ministry, and we have the men's ministry, and it's every week it, it was like declining. The numbers were declining and declining and declining. And Tony and I had our, our Christmas a gift exchange with the teens That's this past week. Do you know how many teens showed up? Two. Two. And I know, like, at first my heart hurt. I was like, wow. But then I thought, these kids went to work. They're working. These kids... Are, are growing. They've got relationships. They've got other, other commitments to life, right? And, and when I stopped and thought about it, I wanted to feel bad, and I was like, oh, this is a reflection of a failure on the church. But from the very start, our goal is to introduce God to them. Show them, show them his voice. That way, when they get older, when they struggle, when they're in the dark, and he calls for them, they understand. They know his voice. They know him. And it, yeah, it's sad. It's sad to see him grow up. Grow up. And I'm thinking uh, one of our kids, uh, Tessa, had said, you know, it's going to be strange because one day you're going to be like walking in the mall or something, and it's going to be like 
one of us with the kid and a husband, and I'm going to be like, oh, Lord, no, no, not yet, not yet. But that's where they are. They're driving. My kids are driving. And my men, I give them a pass because they hurt. Overtime. They're working so much overtime. They're exhausted. I got a message one. I haven't even hung lights yet. I got to get the lights up, man. I got one that, you know, I want to be there, D, but I can't because I'm working. This is 60. I think he said he had worked 74 hours this past week. Why? It's Christmas time. Christmas was not meant to be a burden. I can't express that enough, but you can't shake that, that responsibility that the world has placed on us. And I want to tell them, you know what? Your family would rather have you in the living room with them doing nothing. But that's not what the world tells you. That's not how the world judges you. It's hard. It's hard. And, and, and you look and, and you think about when you have a ministry, and I want to talk about ministries for just a second, find what your ministry is. It doesn't have to be inside the church. But find a way that you can serve because there is a need. And it's so hard to get people to come to you. And I have a feeling that's why Jesus clocked so many steps in his lifetime. He was always traveling, trying to spread the word. His, they were never stationary. It's so hard to get people to come to you. So find what your ministry is. Find a way to reach one person, two people, a child, a man, a woman. It doesn't matter. But just make sure they're okay. Make sure they're okay in this season. Because I think that when you accept responsibility for, for sharing the joy, you become joyful. You understand that you work for someone who loves you unconditionally. He's going to give you everything you need. Let's go to the next slide. Oh, boy. Psalms, when anxiety was great within me, your consolation brought joy to my soul. This season of joy can bring anxiety and fear, but we have to focus our efforts and our energy on joy. You have to be, the word I always use is intentional, right? You can be happy accidentally because something may happen, and that's a, that's a pleasant surprise, right? But in order to be happy constantly, you have to be intentional. You have to be willing to look past certain things. You've got to be willing to look through certain people. You have to be intentional in how you want to feel. Talking to teenagers all the time in in the group and at home, we always say, no one can make you feel anything. No one can make you react to anything. That's a decision that you make intentionally, right? So as adults, when we go out and we see the world trying to push Christ out of Christmas, trying to make other things above Christ at Christmas time, we need to be intentional and refocusing on Jesus. So as we go out today into the world, after, after we get all of our, our group together, you're going to have an opportunity at some point tonight or tomorrow to tell somebody something very simple. Just say it. Jesus loves you. Sometimes I like to sneak that in with the hug. I'm a hugger. So I'll, I'll, I'll hug my guys, and I'll be like, hey, man, it's good to see you. Jesus loves you. you know, just a, just a, I don't want to make it weird, but you just need to know. Share that. Try it. What's the worst that could happen? What's the worst that could happen? It's three, it, is it three? Jesus loves you. It's three simple words. As we move forward, let us, show, let us share his great love and his great joy with those we encounter. Let us go out and show the world that Jesus is king, that Jesus has came to us for salvation, that Jesus is both hope and joy. Come on, okay. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you today to celebrate the great gift that you have sent for us as Jesus Christ. Lord, 
we ask that you give us the strength, the courage, the passion to carry his name out tonight, tomorrow, the day after, into the new year, Lord, that we are unashamed that you make us powerful, Lord, in your name, that the words that we speak reach all those that need it most. In your name we pray, amen.